Okay, session 18, let's pray. Father, we love you. Holy Spirit, again, inflame our heart. Let those divine sparks come and touch our inner man. Lord, we ask that as we study this with our mind and begin to pray the language of this song and these truths back to you, I ask you for that divine spark to the human heart that changes the emotional chemistry of your people. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, session 18, the bride's mature partnership with Jesus. Because last session we uh, completely skipped uh, chapter 7, verse 6 to 9. I'm going to give you at least a sense of what's happening. That the uh, conflict breaks out in 613. The Lord raises up uh, elements of the body of Christ to affirm and to proclaim her beauty and her virtue in chapter 7, 1 to 5. Chapter 7, verse 6 to 9a, the Lord is speaking, and now He is affirming her. This session begins with chapter, with chapter 7, 9b. It's unfortunate that verse 9 should be divided right in the middle. And most all commentators agree with that. There's two complete different directions going on in verse 9. Which is okay, because we can figure it out. In verse 6, the Lord proclaims how beautiful and how pleasant or delightful she is, though the watchmen are sarcastically speaking against her. The Lord says, you're beautiful to me. Chapter 7, verse 6, he's reiterating chapter 6, verse 4, when he said, you're lovely, you're beautiful, and you're awesome. He's, he's uh, uh, referencing that, that uh, dimension of his heart and his view of her. He again pronounces her beauty. Uh, right through the song, every time he talks to her, he calls her my beautiful one or my love. Then he tells her in chapter 7, verse 6, you can just look at it right in your Bibles if your Bibles are open. He says, how pleasant. He says, you are delightful to my heart. You're pleasing and satisfying to me. It's a very dynamic uh, uh, understanding of the heart of the uncreated God views you as pleasant and delightful and satisfying to his heart. Then he calls uh, the characteristic, my love or oh love. With all of your delights, with all of the way that I have designed you and all the ways in redemption, you bring delight back to me. With all of your delights to my heart is what he's saying. I love the word O oh in verse 6. Because God has come to the exclamation point. When God comes to the exclamation point, it's serious. He, this statement is the strongest in the sense that it brings God to the exclamation point. Then in verse 7 of chapter 7, he talks about her stature being like a palm tree. And a palm tree was a symbol of victory, stability, deep roots, could weather all the storms. It went down real deep in its root system. It went up real high. It's so many pictures of spiritual maturity and stature. He affirms her spiritual maturity. Again, he's vindicating her. Then he said, he talks about Her breast-like clusters, her ability to nurture the young ones are abundant. Chapter 7, verse 8, he makes the statement, the promise of the outpouring of the Spirit. He says, I will go up and take hold of you. When the Lord lays hold of His church in power, that's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Lord laid hold of His church in Acts chapter 2. He went up and took hold of the members of the church, the 120 in the upper room. Oh, I love chapter 7, verse 8. When God takes hold of his apostolic vessels, and not that you have to be an apostle, that's not my point, but this one that's commissioned and released at the season, there's that prophetic divine season, and the Lord lays hold of her in power. It's what happened to the apostles when the Spirit of the Lord came upon them in Acts chapter 2. Then he talks about 
her breasts being like the clusters of the vine. Again, he, he is, he's commissioning her in three ways. He said, let your breasts be, let your breath be, and let your mouth be. It's three commissionings. He's telling her, now that the power of God is upon you, I want you to nurture in abundance. I want you, the fragrance of your breath like apples. And the breath speaks of the inner life. I want your inner life refreshed in the, in the power of God and to bring refreshing. Holiness. The excellency of holiness. I, I want the fragrance of your inner life to be refreshing to you and to those that touch you. And then he makes one of the great statements. And he goes, I want the roof of your mouth. Let it be like the best wine. The mouth throughout the song, again, is contrasted to the lips. The lips speak of her speech, of her words. The mouth speaks of intimacy with the Lord. The, the uh, association with the mouth is with the kisses of the mouth. It's defined early on in the song as relating to intimacy. And the Lord proclaims over her, your intimacy is the best wine that I possess. When you give me your heart in fullness, that's the best wine. And I referenced in the last session, this is all from the last session, that Jesus used the phrase in John chapter 2, verse 10, in the wedding feast, the beginning of his messianic ministry, when he said he saves the best wine for last, and now he associates intimacy with her as part of the best wine that God has been waiting for. God looks at you and says the best wine that he possesses is intimacy with you. This is likened into chapter 4 verse 10 when he says that our love is greater than all the wine of this world. Now he goes on and he's talking still about the issue of love and wine, although he uses the phrase the roof of the mouth, but it's parallel to chapter 4, verse 10. He says in 4.10, your love is better than wine. And verse 7, verse 9, he says, intimacy is the very best wine. The very best wine of all the works of my hands comes from the Holy Spirit's work in your heart, making you a lover of God before me. So now he is, let's look at it again, verse 6. You're beautiful. You're pleasant. Oh, you bring me to the exclamation with your delight. Verse 7, your maturity is, is uh, in the superlative. Verse 8, I will visit you with the power of God. Verse 9, I want you to nurture in abundance. I want your inner life to be refreshing. And I want you to know, I want you to live in the reality that intimacy with you is the best wine that I possess. That is the best wine, is the wine related to the bridegroom revelation. It's the wedding wine is the best wine that Jesus saves until the very last. Now in chapter 7, verse 9 at the end, she now responds to this affirmation that is given to her in the first five verses by the daughters and the next three verses by the Lord. Nine verses of affirmation. She is just overwhelmed with, with, it, with encouragement and affirmation after the sarcasm of the watchmen strike her again. Again, these nine verses, chapter 7, 1 to 9, I liken them to chapter 5, verse 10 to 16. These nine verses is what God uses to stabilize her in persecution like the seven verses in chapter 5, verse 10 to 16. He uses that to stabilize her in the, great, in the ultimate twofold test. These are the truths that enrich and empower her when she's being accused and when she's at the center of controversy and division. Now, all of the things I said are in the notes that we didn't look at. But I have to give you a little bit of that because the next session flows out of these realities. If you are in a time of your life where you need affirmation, <laughs> that's our every one of us, <laughs> chapter 7, verse 1 to 9 is... Line upon line, what God would tell us in the midst of controversy and persecution. Just like in chapter 5, it's line upon line, what the Lord would tell us about the beauty of His Son, what the Holy Spirit would communicate about the beauty of Jesus to stabilize us in a time of testing, in a time of disappointment. I don't think this is a time of disappointment. This is just the counterattack of the enemy because she's operating in apostolic power 
and, the, and she's disrupted the powers of darkness. The demons could say, Jesus I know, Paul I know. She is recognized in the, in, the host of, in the midst of the host of darkness. She's made her impact. I remember hearing a sermon. I literally, it was 20 some years ago. It was in 1975. I was just out of college. I was driving in a car and I heard this tape. Leonard Ravenhill, some of you know him. He was preaching on the verse. I've, I've never forgotten it. I've, I've, I've been warmed by it and laughed by it several, laughed at it several times. Since that, he says, he was you know, preaching the, on the verse. He was t- preaching on intercession. And it, he was quoting the verse in Acts 19. Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you to the seven? The demons said to the seven sons of Sceva when he just, when the, the demons uh, uh, gave them trouble, <laughs> beat them up. And, and, and Leonard Ravenhill said, he goes, I, I don't really care uh, what... Uh, building they name after me or what hall they name after me he says I don't want to be known on the earth he says I'm an intercessor he says I want to be known in hell and I just said whoa he says when I stand before the Lord I want to look down in hell and I want to see 15 foot letters in red Raven Hill I can just hear him right now he says I want to see my name emboldened in hell and I want as an intercessor the host of wickedness to be terrified when I come before the Lord I went Woo! And uh, I got a, it made me chuckle and kind of like warmed my heart at the same time. So I don't, uh, uh, I don't uh, see her as discouraged, but it's the inevitable conflicts of spiritual warfare taking place. But these are the truths. And most uh, uh, of you at this point in time are not in a, uh, in a big controversy related to to the anointing on your life right now, so this isn't like massively important, but it, it really might be one day. And it's the kind of truths that we want to feed on now so that we grow into them because they are significant as the Lord affirms us in the time of, of uh, testing and controversy and persecution, which is surely coming to the church before the Lord returns. Okay, now... He's commissioned her to three ministry. Jesus has commissioned her to three different ministries in the Holy Spirit. Now she responds back to the Lord. The Lord has just said to her, the roof of your mouth is best wine. What a fantastic passage. Now the Lord, now the bride begins to respond back right here. The wine goes down smoothly for my beloved, moving gently the lips of sleepers. She's expressing, bridal partnership is expressed in mature obedience to Jesus. The flow of thought changes significantly right in the middle of verse 9. And I've already made that point. She says, she drinks the best wine that the Lord had just referenced the phrase before. That, that she's living in the best wine. The Lord speaks to her and says, intimacy with you is the best wine. And she says, intimacy with you lord the wine goes down smoothly for you the bride now interrupts the lord to share her deep feelings of total commitment to receive anything that comes from him she avoids everything that resists the holy spirit this is her response to the extravagant affirmation in chapter 6 and chapter 7 the wine speaks of the influence and the prompting of the holy spirit Jesus has just said the roof of her mouth is like best wine. This wine is the best wine of the Holy Spirit. It's the wine of intimacy. The wine of bridal intimacy involves the two-sided coin of the revelation of the bridegroom king. Is Jesus releasing his judgments to remove everything that hinders bridal love. And so we have in the book of Revelation a number of statements where the wine poured out, but the Lord Himself declares this as the wine of His wrath, but his, the wine of His wrath and the wine of intimacy are two sides of one coin. They're not two uh, contradictory dimensions in the heart of God. God's heart is, is filled with the wine of romance and intimacy with His church. He wants His church established in love, and He removes everything that hinders love. That, to me, is the simplest definition or purpose of the temporal judgments of the Lord. He's removing everything that hinders love. 
And the wine of this world is associated with fornication. It's, it's associated with the counterfeit to spiritual intimacy. And the enemy is going to orchestrate an explosion of immorality at the end of the age. The counterfeit wine. And the Lord's going to answer that counterfeit wine with the true wine of intimacy in the church and the wine of judgment that removes everything that hinders intimacy in the church. All of these are associated and brought together under the imagery of wine in the Bible. It's very purposeful. It's not accidental. The wine of judgment and the wine of intimacy with the church are two sides of one coin. It's the wine of the Holy Spirit. It's when the Lord, it's when the season comes where He removes everything that hinders his, his, the wine of intimacy. And the thing that He's focused on is the counterfeit wine. It's the explosion, the outrage of immorality that is exploding across the earth, which its purpose in Satan's scheme is to capture the affections of the human race to himself. And then to defile and incapacitate human beings in their ability to give their affections to the Lord by perverting them and condemning them with immorality and perversion. She commits herself to instant full obedience. She says, the wine of God, the wine of intimacy, goes down smoothly. I love this phrase. She easily receives the wine of love. She assimilates it with no resistance. There's no hindrances in her life to the wine of intimacy. We have a number of natural hindrances in our, in our humanity against intimacy. The best wine, the, the wine of divine romance. We have ideas that are wrong that make us draw back from intimacy with the Lord. Part of our brokenness and woundedness through life. We have sin and compromise that holds us in check in terms of our development of intimacy. And she says, this wine, this call to intimacy with the ideas of believing what God says about her, and the call to intimacy that implies that she says yes to all the mandates of the Lord. She goes, this call to intimacy, your wine, your best wine, I assimilate it. It goes down easy. I don't choke over it. I don't, I don't have to wrestle with it and count the cost. Yes! instantly, enthusiastically, I want the wine of God. It goes down easily because I love you. That's what she's saying here. The bride doesn't want the Lord to have to wrestle with her to obey Him in every area of her life. When the Holy Spirit hints, she says, yes, there's an extravagance. The wine of intimacy, the call to win intimacy, even the understanding of the Lord's administration of His judgments, which is also a part of the wine of intimacy. She says, I easily say yes to you. Your whispers I respond to. I don't have to, like the new believer, count the cost for weeks and months. There's a yes and there's a growing yes, a stronger yes in my spirit. It's the lovesick heart, the instant response. The heart of the lovesick bride is not asking how to get away with more carnality and how to live more in the spirit of the world without losing our salvation. That's not the, the heart of the bride. The heart of the bride is, is seeking grace to be more abandoned, to be more extravagant. The question in the bride's heart is how can I give more? The question in a large part of the body of Christ is, what do I have to do? What's the bare requirements to still stay in the sphere called salvation? I don't want to get so close to the edge that I lose my confidence. So I want to go clear to the line and live as carnal as I can. And that's what's in, that's the question abiding in the heart of the church in the Western world. How far can I go without being shamed or judged or getting in serious trouble with the Lord? But the heart of the lovesick bride is exactly opposite. She's seeking the Lord for permission, for invitations, and for enabling to be abandoned far beyond the call of duty, of the requirements. She's lovesick. She wants to give everything. She says the wine of intimacy, the call to intimacy is an easy call. It instantly assimilates in my spirit. It goes down smoothly because I love you. In the poetic language of love, she says the wine goes down smoothly, the call to intimacy, to move to you. With to accept your thoughts of how you love me, to obey your mandates, to follow you wherever you go, 
to understand your ways, your administration of history as you lose your judgment, because that's going to be the, the critical issue in the body of Christ is the temporal judgments of the Lord. The backside of the wine of intimacy, the, the activity of the Lord that destroys the things that hinder intimacy. Again, that will be the crisis at the end of the age is how the human race is going to respond to the Lord who's, who's, the, one, who's the author, who's the one orchestrating the devastation of so many human lives across the earth as seen in the book of Revelation without finding contradiction in Him and finding Him to be the God, the bridegroom king, the God of beauty and love and life that He declares Himself to be. Jesus told the disciples, can you drink the cup? That I'm about to drink. He told them that uh, at the Last Supper, it's the cup of wine, and it all flows together. He, Jesus was drinking the cup of the Spirit's wine. Perfect obedience and complete abandonment to the will of the Father, regardless what it cost him. That was the wine that Jesus drank. And the bride here says, the cup that you give me goes down smoothly. I will not make you wrestle with me to obey you. There's a, I'm seeking you for permission and for grace and empowerment to go beyond that which you ever require to give myself as extravagantly as I can before God in love by the power of the Spirit. Now we need the Spirit's help. Areas in my life that I want to go beyond the the basic requirements associated with salvation, with responding in sincerity to salvation, I've asked the Lord over the years for grace. In the arena of economics, I asked the Lord, I wanted to give a, a certain measure of which I've been able to, to walk in throughout all of my days, I mean for the last 20 some years in the gospel. I said, I don't want to be Christianity 101 tither. I began to ask the Lord when I was 18, 19, 20, I want the grace of the Lord, I want your permission, your ability to live far beyond that. And it's something the Lord's helped me to live in for over 20 years. And it doesn't matter what it is, but the point of it is, is that there were There were realms in the Lord like in the realm of economics. I said, I want to live at this level and more besides. And the Lord's answer is, well, you don't have to. Oh, Lord, I I want the power and the grace to do it. Will you let me? Will you empower me to do it? I began to ask the Lord questions about uh, dimensions of fasting, dimensions of prayer, dimensions in my private life with the Lord, if he would enable me to respond in a certain way. That was above that which is associated with the sincerity required in salvation. My point being, in the heart of the bride, the question is a different question than what's in the heart of the watchman. The religious spirit says, how much can I get away with without getting in serious trouble or getting put to shame in the church? And the heart of the bride has a totally different question, and it's embodied in the sentence, it goes down smoothly. I don't choke on the wine, the cup of wine that God serves me. I delight in it. Oh, what a sentence. This is one of those great uh, uh, prayer sentences where you can, in your heart before the Lord, when the Lord challenges you and you respond, Lord, the wine goes down smoothly for you, my beloved. That's a good prayer sentence to say back to God when you feel the struggle and the tensions. And I don't mean just in scandalous sin as the Lord is wooing you to a life of greater abandonment and there's permissible but not edifying things that you can get away with but they don't enrich your heart and love. And you say, Lord, it goes down smoothly for you. I say yes to you. I want to go above and beyond. I don't want to, I, I don't want to just uh, live in the bare requirements. I, we want a heart that's abandoned to the Lord. Is that right? It goes down smoothly for my beloved. It's a wonderful confession of faith in times when the Lord challenges. I just said that. We speak within our heart to the Lord. Okay, I just said all that. Okay. She approaches the divine promise. She approaches the divine promise of of chapter 7, verse 8, when the Lord says, I will lay hold of the branches. I will anoint you. And she says, okay, if you're going to anoint me, If you're going to put your power on me like you did in the Acts chapter 2, then I want you to release me into the greater works than these. That's what Jesus said. Right? John 14, 12. He said, you'll do greater works than these. There's an anointing for greater works than these. 
But she's applying this anointing first to the ability to walk in the first commandment. And secondly, in the ability to move in power ministry to help others. Greater works than these, I believe, is most substantially fulfilled in wicked, sinful people living with the first commandment first. The anointing that God gives the broken human heart to be abandoned lovers of God, the anointing of the first commandment, I believe, is the highest expression of greater works than these. Living like people from another world because our citizenship is in another world and so is our crown and our throne and our city is in another world. And I believe that the Lord wants us to move in the greater works than these miracle dimensions in ministry to others. He wants us to to hold out for that in intercession. But beloved, that is secondary. It's not unimportant. It's very important. But I believe God's raising up a people that seek the anointing to become lovers of God before they seek the anointing to increase their public ministries. We don't have to really choose between the two. We can do both together. I don't believe that it's necessary to choose between them. We can do both and. The power of God as that which enables her to receive the call to drink the cup of intimacy without choking on it, that it would go down smoothly in love. I believe that in chapter verse 9, this is an overflow of the promise of power in chapter 7 verse 8. When the Lord says, I will anoint you, I will visit you, always grab a hold of that and say, give me the heart of the first commandment first. And give me the spirit of revelation, because the spirit of revelation and the beauty of the Lord, those are two sides of one coin, because the spirit of revelation causes you to love the Lord, and to love the Lord causes you to long for revelation of His beauty. They they work together. If an angel appears to you and says, whatsoever things you want, you can have. Asking for the kisses of his mouth. Say, warm and woo and wow my heart with the word of God as a lover of God. Oh yes, and let me raise the dead in the nations. But only after you've given me an anointing to to grow and to pursue the first commandment. If ever you get one of those fill-in-the-blank angelic visitations, ask for the first commandment anointing first. And the angel will smile and say, you're one of those love sicklings, I can tell. Probably the angel will say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and give you the whole, the whole package now. I'm not entirely joking. We want to pursue the anointing as that which empowers us to live in a supernatural way from the heart. And our hands will get on fire soon enough. Our hands will be filled with fire of power to touch others. The church is, doesn't have that many people that operate in power, but it's rare for someone to operate in power in their hands and to have their heart tenderized in love towards God. It's typically one or the other. The effective ministry of the Holy Spirit through the bride. The wine goes down smoothly for my beloved. Now listen to this. Moving gently the lips of sleepers. She goes, when I say yes to the call to, to intimacy with God, to drink the cup of intimacy... When I say yes to the call to intimacy, and not only say yes, but it goes down smoothly, it's an extravagant, it's an eager, it's a, a, above and beyond the call of duty kind of yes. It's an extravagant yes. It says yes with no qualifications. It's love with no price tags. It's, it's wealthy love that doesn't have to look to see how much it costs because we're wealthy. A wealthy person, when they go into the store, they don't ask how much it costs. They can buy the store. I mean, a truly wealthy. I mean, I'm talking about the billionaire people. The billionaire people. They don't go into Kmart and see if this thing's a better deal than that deal. I know they don't go into Kmart, but just let that go for now. <clears throat> when, 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 when we're truly wealthy, we don't look at price tags. It goes down smoothly. It's easy. Sets well with me. It resonates in my spirit to go above and beyond the basic requirements. We're not earning anything. It's not about earning. It's about responding. It's radically different than earning. We don't do this so the Lord will pay attention to us. We do it because He has paid attention. We do it because of what happened in chapter 6 and 7. The affirmations of chapter 6 and 7 produce this smooth reception of the wine of intimacy. 
We don't do it to produce the affirmation in six or seven. Rather, it's the outflow of receiving the affirmation. But look what happens. This wine that she says yes to, that extravagantly says yes to, it goes down smoothly. It ends up impacting the lips of spiritual sleepers. The Holy Spirit gently awakens the sleepers. Paul the Apostle on a number of times, calls the carnal uh, believers in the body of Christ as spiritual sleepers. This phrase is used regularly in the Old and the New Testament. The wine that the bride assimilates quickly and enthusiastically ends up impacting the spiritually dull ones around her. The sleepers that are around her moves them deeply. When the Lord begins to do deeper work, when you go deeper and higher, like the palm tree, your roots go deeper and your branches reach higher. We go deeper in God and we go higher in God. The sleepers, the dull ones around you, some will get angry and others will be awakened and deeply moved. They will see the reality in your life and they will be moved. I like the word number four, it moving gently, the the lips of, it moves them. Every word in this verse is filled with meaning. Every word, literally, of verse 9 is filled with meaning. The Holy Spirit desires to woo us gently. It moves gently the, the lips of these sleepers. The Holy Spirit, wine, the best wine, the call to intimacy... The call to the best wine in the romance of the gospel, to intimacy with the Lord. Again, which involves right ideas about how God views you and the truth about God. And this intimacy also involves a right response to say yes to his wooings and his challenges. It's it's obedience and it's faith. It's faith, it's believing what he says about us and it's responding with a yes in our spirit to the the, uh, challenges he gives us. But the wine of intimacy influences our life through gentle promptings he leads us often through subtle yet distinct impressions this is important here he will not often strive with us in an extreme way except on rare occasions he is calling us to voluntary love skip a sentence or two he wants lovers to go forth into the deep things and to be lovers it requires a voluntary response and the lord typically employs gentleness the wooings This last 30 days of most of us in this room, the Lord gently woos us to invest our time differently, to begin to fill our minds with the Word of God. He's not going to cause our house to burn down and all of our money to be lost in order to get us to read the Bible. That's, I mean, occasionally there's a tremendous divine disruption that awakens somebody. But the rule of God is he's, he's, He's plucking the string of the voluntary lover's heart. He gently woos us. And we need to learn to say yes to the south winds, not only to the violent north winds, the cold north winds. We need to be wooed by the gentle south winds. The next 30 days, every one of you are going to spend your time and your money and your words a certain way. And because we're all broken, sinful human beings, undoubtedly the Spirit of God will be gently wooing us to invest our time, our money, and our words in ways a little differently than we would live without his influence. Quite a bit differently. And she's saying the gentle move of the Holy Spirit is wooing them. It's moving them. And it's moving them to such an impact. Number six, this is the ultimate impact. It leaves the disciples of the bride with inspired speech. Every, every word is so meaningful in this, in this sentence. She has trained disciples who speak with Holy Spirit inspired gentleness because they've been wooed by gentleness. Again, the Lord does not typically, there, there are some very strong divine disruptions in our life occasionally in the course of our whole life on the earth. There's a few of those typically. The Lord's rule of his kingdom is he He plucks the heart of the voluntary lover with gentleness. He woos us to spend our time, our money, and our words, our thoughts, to invest them differently. And months and years can go by and we don't have to say yes to the wooing. And the Lord will allow us. Because it's a love decision. 
This isn't an enforced captivity. This is a lovesick wooing that he's gently wooing us into. The trained disciples, they have a Holy Spirit-inspired speech. They operate in gentleness because they've been wooed by gentleness. Godly speech is the final frontier of deep spirituality. There is no question about that in the Bible. James the Apostle said, If anyone does not stumble in his word, the words he speaks, is a perfect man. He's able to bridle every passion in his body if he can bridle his speech. Then James says that, uh, the next verse down here, he says that if anyone thinks that they're spiritual... They think they have depth in God, but they haven't bridled their speech yet. They're deceived in their own heart. doesn't mean they're not genuine with the Lord. It just means they don't have spiritual depth. They think they do, but they don't yet. They're deceived about it. Speech is the final frontier to be changed. And this bride says, when I say yes to this extravagant, instant, aggressive yes to the wine of intimacy, it doesn't stop there. I bring a whole host of people with me in the path. A lot will be disrupted and be angry, and they'll say, oh, it's foolish just what you're doing. But that kind of abandonment always brings a host with them sooner or later. I don't mean millions, but those that the Lord has put around you. The sleepers are awakened, and their speech is transformed, which speaks of their entire life transformed. What a massive statement. Her twofold spiritual identity. Look at this. She says, the wine goes down smoothly for my beloved. Even so much that it impacts the people at the deepest level possible. It changes the way they talk. It changes their brash, critical, complaining, slanderous, unbelieving speech into Holy Spirit speech. What a sentence. And then she just breaks out. She goes, I am my beloved's. His desire is towards me. That's the strength of her heart right there. That's the key of everything. She's not doing this to get him to desire her. She's doing it because she knows he desires her. It's very opposite. The bride's obedience is rooted in this twofold spiritual identity. She sees herself as a lover of God, and she sees herself as one Jesus deeply desires. Her spiritual identity is a lover. I am my beloved's. I am my beloved. She says... The affirmation of chapter 7, 1 to 9 leads her to this confession of faith. In other words, I totally belong to him. She wants the wine to go down smoothly because she knows she belongs totally to him and that his raging desire is focused on her. She goes, why wouldn't it go down smoothly when I understand his desire for me? Why wouldn't I desire unity with him when I understand how much he desires me? Her spiritual identity established as being a lover of God. I am a lover of Christ Jesus. I belong to Him. The confession of her identity is vital to her ability to love God and to receive the call to intimacy smoothly. In the mind of God, this is very important, you are a lover of God before you're anything else. Even in our spiritual immaturity, God looks at your life and my life. He sees a cry in our spirit. He does not define us by our struggle. He doesn't define us by our economics. He doesn't define us by the people we relate to. He defines us by the cry in our spirit for Him as lovers of God. We define ourselves by our struggle. He defines us by the cry in our heart to be His, and she lives in that. It's more than a cry in her heart at this stage of the game. At this stage of her maturity, she's actually living as in mature love. She goes, my life is identified. I may not have any wealth or fame, or nobody may pay attention to me, but I leave this world It lost in the identity that I am a lover of God in my few times on the earth. I am successful I am loved and I am a lover, therefore I am successful. In his economy, we are primarily lovers of God. I love what Peter said in John 21, 17. And he's failing. We looked at this in the early sessions. And the Lord and Peter finally learns, he looks at the Lord, he says, You know everything. You know I love you. Peter is saying, You know everything. You know my sin, but you know. More powerful than my sin is the cry in my spirit, my identity, my calling before you to be a lover of God. You know everything, and you know I'm a lover of God. And that restored Peter from his shame. Oh, what a sentence. 
We are most defined by the fact we are lovers of God and His desire is towards us. This is one of the greatest definitions of redeemed humanity. This is one of the greatest statements in the Scripture. Seven, ten, seven, chapter, seven, seven, ten, seven, chapter 7, verse 10. One of the great twofold uh, 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 concepts, twofold identity in one verse. One of the greatest statements in Scripture as far as I'm concerned. Coming out of the heart of the mature bride, her understanding of who she is in reality. Beloved, you're not about how big your meetings are or how big your business is or how many anointed, cool people like you. Your, your life is so much more rich than those things. I don't, you could have everything in all those departments and all the matter up don't even begin to weigh in the balance of the truth. You are a lover of God, one of the rare ones of the earth, and His desire is inflamed towards you. That is one drop of that is worth all the other human earthly achievements added up together. I know that it's easy to say yes to that, but that is absolute true. This is the way out of all the internal confusion we have inside of ourselves about who we are and what's really important. And are we doing it? Are we bad? Are we good? This is the way out in one sentence, chapter 7, verse 10. Now, the the reality is you don't start with chapter 7, verse 10. Chapter 7, verse 10 is seven chapters, ten verses into the revelation of the bride and the bridegroom. We don't start in chapter 7, verse 10. I mean, it's okay to begin to reach for that, but this thing awakens in its more full dimensions a little bit down the road, although we begin to drink from this well right now. Remember, this isn't Christianity 101. She's mature. She's walking in the love of God in a deep way. And these things are resounding in her being. Chapter 7, verse 10 will fill the consciousness of the saints in their resurrected bodies in the eternal city forever. We'll walk around and we'll have streets of gold, mansions, power, angels, thrones, worlds. And they'll say, wow, boy, you really struck it rich. I am a lover of God and he's absolutely lovesick over me. Yeah, but look how big your house is. Oh, I like my big house. I am a lover of God and he is lovesick over me. That's how we're going to think of ourselves with all the wealth and the power we'll have forever and forever. I believe that chapter 7 verse 10 is the bridal identity at its at its finest right there her identity as the one that jesus desires she has profound insight into jesus's emotional makeup his enjoyment of her is the power it is the power of her emotional life the revelation of his enjoyment of her is the power of her emotional life that's it right there that's that's, if, if you're looking for great secrets, that's one of the great secrets of the spiritual life right there. It's what causes persecution to be manageable. It's what causes disappointment to have its proper proportion. The proper pr- proportion of difficulty is of a lovesick believer that's enlightened, as we looked at the other day, is Romans 8, 18. Paul says the, it's incomparable. The sufferings of this age compared to what I'm getting. Second Corinthians 4.17, he goes, the sufferings of this age are temporary, they're light, they're very short term, and they're really nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory. We look at that and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Paul says, no, I'm living in Song of Solomon 7 verse 10. That is real to me. It is real to me. That is the secret of Paul's life. Those apostolic statements seem grandiose and unrealistic. They flow out of the heart of an enlightened, lovesick man. This, the revelation of his enjoyment of her is the great power of her emotional life. Beloved, this is it. I'm going to say something that might sound negative. If this is true, then why is it the, the body of Christ spends endless thousands of hours per year just stuffing their life with so much recreation and entertainment and all the junk they fill themselves with and their Bibles lay dust covered and this will completely change everything in their life if they can get a hold of this. Why is it that this, the enemy has so presented this that this looks so difficult and burdensome to drink from this well called the Word of God? Her desire, his desire for her captured. Jesus' desire, his fiery desire for her has captured her heart. She's gripped by what gripped him. His greatest desire is for her. She understood, this is a stunning revelation. It's not just that She's desired, this is a a subtle point, but an important point. She says, forget me for now. What are you thinking about? I want to 
Be involved in what is most important to you. Forget me right now. I'm thinking about you right now, Lord. He says, there's one thing that captures me and thrills me. It ravishes me. She goes, oh, I want to get involved with it. What is it? The way I feel about you and Bernard of Clairvaux taught about loving ourselves for God's sake. He talked about four progressions of love. And the ultimate one, it says, when we actually love ourselves because we are the object of his ravished desire, and that's what he likes best is you, so you just jump in and go with it. It's viewing ourselves, not just seeing this, this verse primarily on how it affects our happiness, although it does, but viewing this verse primarily on how it makes him happy is how she's doing this. She's lost in what he's lost in. It happens to be her. But if it was something else, she would have been lost in it is the point. But the fact that it is her confirms it's an eternal relationship of divine love sickness. He goes, oh, I'm lost in love, but it's with you. Oh, beloved, this is a great statement. I recommend this truth in our prayer time, a worship service, walking down the hallway at work, driving in the car. We can speak this in five and ten second prayers under our breath intermittently through the day all the time and it washes defilement off of our spirit it enriches our heart it enlines our soul this kind of confession of who we are oh she is so lovesick now she uh, chapter 7 verse 11 come my beloved let us go to the fields let us lodge in the village villages let us get up early to the vineyards let us see if the vine has budded where the grapes the grape uh Blooms are open and whether the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. Now we need to compare chapter 7 verse 11, this verse, with chapter 6 verse 11. Because as we looked at last time, chapter 6 verse 11, she goes to the garden to see. Chapter 7 verse 11, she goes there to lodge. Verse 6, she's captured and her soul suddenly becomes like the chariot that moves swiftly Chapter uh, 7, verse 11, she wants to camp there. It's, it's not a, a visit where she's opening her spirit to others. She is captured with them and with the Lord. And the Lord's desire is for her, as translated in her thinking, she goes, in other words, your desire, your ravishing desire, is for your people for which I am one of them. It's an intensely personal revelation to her, but it's also uh, the way she views the redeemed. She goes, if you're lovesick over these people, then why don't I go help them if you're so lovesick over them? If you're lovesick over your people, then I'm going to be lovesick over them. He says, okay, start with yourself. Okay, I love me for your sake, and now I'll love your people for your sake. It's the, she, she is investing her being into that which ravishes his heart. That's what's going on here. She goes, okay, I don't care how messed up anything is. If it's your heart, I'm going to go help them with new eyes, with a new patience. Now, as you compare verse chapter 7, verse 11 and 12 with chapter 6, verse 11, you'll notice that in verse 12, the immature ministries are present in verse 12, chapter 7, and all this is in the notes, whereas in chapter 6, it was the flourishing ministries the flourishing ministries and the budding vines, but here it's only the budding ones. She has said, the flourishing ones, I bless you, go for it. I'm going to invest myself in the -the out-of-the-way places of the struggling, burdened, broken-down ones with little resource and little understanding. She blesses, like Paul went into Jerusalem after he was converted, and after he went through all the years of training and the years in the desert, some 14 years later, some scholars believe, and he comes back to Jerusalem. It says in Galatians 2, gives the account, he, he, he receives the right hand of pe- uh, fellowship from Peter, James, and John. He says, I'd love to hang out with you guys, but you're flourishing vineyards. I'm going to go to the out of the way places that know nothing, that are struggling, that are budding vineyards, and I'm going to strengthen them. Here, You don't find the flourishing ones. She's now going to invest herself in the ones the Lord has ravished for that are bankrupt and broken. Wrong thinking. No resource. Nothing happening. Strife. It just, they're stuck. And she's going to go help the budding vineyards now. But when you compare them, it's obvious the flourishing ones aren't present at this point in the psalm. 
He's describing, I have it laid out, the, the various ways that she, her heart is captured for the people that have captured the Lord. Though they're weak and immature, they're not under her banner. They're not churches giving to her ministry. They're not people that are, that are enhancing her ministry profile and platform. It's none of that. She's lost in love for the ones the Lord's lost in love for. She goes, I don't care what label they have on their building and they're a little quirky and different. That's okay. You, you ravished over them. I'm going to and I'm going to help them. Now, you can't just go everywhere because of that heart because we have limited capacities as, as a limited human beings. But her willingness is the point of her horizon see beyond that which enhances her ministry. She has a legitimate enthusiasm for that that, what, that does not enhance her own ministry platform. And that's, that is the sign of the love of God. It's, it's rare, but it will be very common before it's over. And that's going to be the, the, uh, some of the uh, atmosphere of unity. But so she's going. I mean, the second commandment, the great commission, she's really in it now. I mean, she's going all the way. Again, we do the first and the second commandment, the great commission, at every season of our life. We do it at different emphasis at different seasons, but we're always doing all three of those. The first commandment, the second commandment, the great commission. From the day we're born again, we say yes to all three of them. We never put one of them on the shelf. We're saying yet we, we, our lifestyles have different applications related to those three. But one of the reasons we seek the Lord is to be able to deliver people. It's not the only, it's not the primary reason, but that is a reason. Part of my seeking of the Lord is to establish the second commandment. It's to, to help broken people by bringing something that changes their life back to them. I seek the Lord for the Lord and for myself. But I also know that if I seek the Lord hard, I can change the lives of broken people. Now, I mean, I go to all their parties and all their this and that, but I'm pressing into the Lord to get something to change their life one day. And I think of that as a second commandment commitment. I just want to put that in perspective, and that's in those last 10 pages. Come, my beloved, let us go forth to the, to the fields, to the villages, to the vineyards. Look at this, the fields, the villages, the vineyards. This aggressive going. She's telling Jesus, let us go. Remember earlier on, Jesus says in chapter 2, rise up and come with me. She goes, no. Now she's telling the Lord in intercessory prayer, come with me. Come with me. Lay hold of me in power. Let's go. And the Lord's going, boy, you love what I love, don't you? She is so opposite of hesitant like she was in chapter 2. She's ready to go. She wants to go to the, vi- to the field, to the villages, to the vineyards, and we have those described. She goes, it's, here's the sentence, it's there I will give you my love. What a sentence. What a sentence. Let's, let's develop that. She says, it's there I will give you my love. There in the fields of labor, labor. They're in the place of selfless, uh, selfless labors for others, where the risks of faith, where persecution is unavoidable. Disappointment is unavoidable. She fully has embraced running and drawing. I I skipped this in the earlier pages. It's written down for you. Remember chapter 1 verse 4. Draw me and let me run. Well now she's drawing and running together. She's doing both of them. Chapter 7 and 8. She's running as strong as she's being drawn. The two of them have come together in fullness. Disappointments are unavoidable. She's fully embraced running and drawing. What a fantastic thing. The Lord's goal is to draw us in intimacy as we run in ministry. In other words, that we love Him while we're ministering alongside of Him. Some of God's servants lose their intimacy because of the burden of their labor and ministry. I will give you my love in the hardships and in the hassles of ministry. The mature bride will not diminish her love while under persecution and the burden of ministry. In other words, Jesus wanted to bring together intimacy and ministry without losing one for the other. The Lord's plan is to have a bride who works with Him as she loves Him. She's a worshiping warrior. She does war in His embrace while she loves Him. She's a a lover worker or a worshiping warrior. The two of them have come together. It's one thing to give Jesus our love in private with no distractions. It's a different thing to give Him our love in the battle when we're being mistreated, we're being abused. There are so many emotions in the battle that get stirred up. It's tough in the battle, but that's where He ultimately wants the love of His bride in His embrace and partnership, discipling the nations, worshiping and warring together with Him, not choosing one or the other. 
There I will give you my love. Not just in isolation, but in the labor, the warfare, the sacrifice, the persecution, the mistreatment, the conflicts. In the midst of this, I don't lose love for you. Those are the things that make us lose our love. When we, when we begin to overemphasize ministry, that's the key word is overemphasize. We do ministry. I've been doing ministry from since the day I was born again. Some version of it. Been leading Bible studies and going to them and witnessing people literally since the week I was born again. 25 years ago. We always do ministry. But ministry that does not have a foundation of the longing to be drawn in intimacy, that ministry burns us out. It burns us out. But when the two are brought together, we're not burnt out by the work. We're invigorated. It's there that I give you my love. Oh, we can't. We don't have time to finish, but the the next five or six verses you're going to like. Amen. Let's stand. Oh, we love you, Lord. There I give you my love. Imagine walking in love while people are criticizing and abusing and persecuting. Just hot in love. I have the passage there in Acts 16. Paul's in prison, whipped and beaten, singing love songs to God in prison. I mean, there it is right there. What a picture of it. His back is bleeding. They are, they, they've already pronounced they're going to. I mean, it looks like he's going to be killed. Or beat again. He says, I love you. I love you. This is where love brought me. That's fine. I'll do it again. He did do it again. I love you. I love you. And the prison door opens. It doesn't always open. Sometimes they just kill you. You step into that celestial city and you go, wow, it's way better than I thought. Oh, Lord, we love you. His desire is for me. What a sentence. I'm a lover of God. Yes, Lord, I'm weak. I struggle. I come up short. I get confused. I'm unanointed in areas that I want the anointing. I'm deficient. That's not who I am, though. Those are things that describe my my, uh, uh, different areas of my life. But I'm a lover of God. That's how you see me. I want you to say that before the Lord in your own way. I'm a lover of God. That's who you are. And your raging desire. Oh, I want to know it. I want to stand alongside you in your desire. And it's for me. It's for me. Oh, I want to say yes to what burns in your heart. And if it's me, then I want to say yes to it. I receive it. I agree with it. He says, my desire burns for others. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.